next curve. Welcome to another episode of Next Curve's Rethink Podcast, where tech industry thought leaders discuss the trends and technologies that are shaping our digital future. And I'm Leonard Lee, Managing Director and Founder of Next Curve. And today, I'm happy to have, once again, a very special guest and friend, Joe Hoffman, fellow industry analyst and research director with SAR Insights and Consulting. Joe Really good to have you again. This is going to be fun. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. And uh, if you haven't already, please check out our research blog at www.next-curve.com. Also, subscribe to our YouTube and Apple podcast channels. Just search for Next Curve and they'll bring it right up. Just click that subscribe button and you're going to be good to go. So, Joe, today we will be talking about a topic that you are just so passionate about, I know. I know this. I know this about you. We're going to be talking about... Tiny machine learning, or as the uh, foundation calls it, tiny ML. Dinky ML, yes. Yep. So today, the agenda is going to be like this. We're going to talk about uh, what is tiny ML and why it's important, and then we'll talk about some of the principles about how it works, and then we will get a little bit into how Tiny ML will kind of change the way we think about a AI computing models. And I don't mean that by models, I mean the computing model. And what are some of the ideal early applications that we're seeing with Tiny ML? So that sound good, Joe? That's good. All right, Ready great. So let's start off with the first bit here, which is what is tiny ML and why should anyone care? Well, if you've been watching any of the news lately, you've seen that uh, the whole world is a guy at, um, at machine learning in general, basically from all the work that's taken off from developing neural networks in the past, eight, eight, basically five or six years, really and truly. Neural mm-hmm. networks and, and, and machine learning have been around for a long time, artificial yeah. intelligence, but now it's really taking off. Because of cheap computing, cheap memory, and now lots of sensors and data. What we mean by tiny ML is actually running the inference part of the engine, that is deciding what is and what is not, on small devices. I mean, if you look at what Google does today with their data centers or NVIDIA or any of the big cloud things, or even uh, way more with their cars, they have huge, huge computer resources applied to those things. Right. Doing very complex things. Well, with tiny machine learning, you're actually taking those applications or developing applications that work on embedded machine controllers, which are little tiny 32-bit processors, right. things that might be as simple as controlling your uh, windows in your car going up and down or your windshield wipers, things that might cost a dollar for a chip or something like that. And even at the high end, you know, they might cost 8 or 10 or $15. But what we're doing now is what's happening in the industry. A lot of work is developing. How do you get things to run neural networks and artificial intelligence and other uh, other schemes like that on these little tiny computers where you're limited by power, you're limited by memory, and you're limited by cost and all those sorts of things. And people are getting smart about figuring out how to do these things. Right. And power as well, right? I don't know if you mentioned yes. that. Power, power is a big, big thing. And I know that uh, you guys over at SAR um, – SAR Research and Consulting, you're doing a lot of research on some of these rather constrained or relatively constrained personal devices like those earbuds, exactly. right? Which are getting, like you said, uh, before we jumped on, on this podcast or before we hit the record button, are, are becoming increasingly intelligent. And I think uh, really Apple probably uh, set the pace here in terms of intelligence and uh, devices such as the, mm-hmm. the earpiece, right? Or the right, right. headphone. I mean, if you look at what's happening, like we'll call them the true wireless stereo earbuds, TWS for short. When they first come out, you were lucky to get like a two hour battery lifetime on them. And then even when they were early out, you had the Braggy come out with their dash, which was really a, a significant platform with everything that went into the earbuds. But people found out, and the industry found out, people really wanted more air time. So now they've got a lifetime on these uh, devices up to around six, eight, or ten hours before you have to hit recharge. Now they're looking at other things to put on that. What can you do? Noise cancellation, 
right. automatic noise cancellation, adaptive noise cancellation. Yeah, You've exactly. seen on Air, on your on your AirPod Pros, they've with yeah. a software update now. You've got what spatial audio, call it 3D audio, or whatever you want, whatever Apple's calling it. And that was just with a software update. No new hardware to do that. So I'm excited to see what what's the next generation of, of Apple AirPod Pros are going to do, and as they keep moving on and on. So there they are. And then the the AirPod Pros are an interesting one because I've read, and it's my understanding that they have like 10 microprocessor cores in those things. Some doing DSP, some doing control processing. Right. Right. And they have packed an awful lot of power yeah. in those little earbuds. Yeah. And you still get eight, 10 hours of, of battery life before you stick them back in the charger. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with them, uh, you get four hours, but the technology is getting better and better every generation, obviously. I mean, right. that, that goes without saying, but I think that's a, that's a kind of a good example of where we're going with tiny ML, right? But we're now talking about even more constrained devices and uh, applications of right. AI being put on these really tiny low power devices, right? Actually, yeah. Um, I mean, these earbuds are a great example. Now, why do we see this as, this as being sort of an important trend for ML? What are some of your thoughts there? There is a whole world of applications that you can do with machine learning, neural networks based, that you can't really do with DSP or algorithms and things like that. Mm. An example, when we were talking to Oticon about their research in uh, hearing aids, Mm. They are actually are developing technology and software that allows the people with hearing aids who have hearing challenges to actually separate the audio out from people around them. So you hear this guy speaking here and that guy speaking there as opposed to everything coming in the past. You just can't right. do that with DSP. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking with Battle Labs. I just got yeah. by uh, Cisco. And if you can see a de demo online on YouTube, the guy is literally standing there right below a freeway, and you can hear all the sound and noise sounds and traffic and everything. He clips on their noise cancellation, and it's all gone, both directions. You can't do that with DSP. You can do, like, filtering and things like that. But there's so much that you can't do with DSP. Now, the interesting thing is a lot of this stuff can run on existing uh, DSP cores that you find inside your earbuds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we talk to vendors, how do you upgrade and actually take advantage of that? Basically, it comes down to a little more memory, maybe a little more powerful processor. Maybe you kick up from the two-core chip to the four core chip and, and all kinds of things like that. So I think it from audio is probably the main driver right now. Mm -hmm. It's just an obvious use case. It's not as difficult as video is to try and, and, and adapt to. And it carries an awful lot of human content. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just uh, it's an exciting time to be looking at that, watching that technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk, spend a little bit of time talking about some of the principles of tiny ML that make it work. I mean, what are we seeing that's different? I know that what we're fundamentally talking about is taking trained models or pre-trained models and kind of compressing them. I mean, the idea is to make them much smaller while at the same time maintaining their efficacy or efficiency or accuracy, if you will, but then being able to sit there and put them onto a device in a way that it's going to be uh, able to run on a low power device what are some of the mechanics that uh, that you're seeing as you've done research on the topic of tiny ML? If you go to any of the conferences or in the papers, there's a lot of things yeah. are being invented as we speak. Yeah. The traditional approaches are you develop your algorithm up in the cloud somewhere on you know the 64-bit yeah. processing computer and farm. Yeah. And you train it and do all, once, all that that you want to do. And then you work with your chip vendor, whether it's a Qualcomm or NXP mm. or ST Micro. And now they have frameworks that allow you to take those designs and there's a handful actually a bucket full of standard techniques you can use as far as pruning down from 64 bits to even down to eight bits or two bits or four bits whatever we want to do to to reduce the amount of logic goes into those things yeah. uh you can reduce the precision you can reduce uh, the number of trees a standard technique is if you find in the various multiplications that are happening in your trimmed in your final uh, architecture that are zero or near to zero, you just go ahead and zero them out. And then when you transfer it over, that never gets implemented in the tiny logic it's in the machine like that. Mm -hmm. Those are all the standard techniques. There's some new interesting ones that are coming out, which are, are a little bit further behind and, and getting industry traction, like spiking neural networks. And at the tiny email conference, one inventor was even talking about using 
is actual tiny email running on battery power to actually do machine inferencing, not inferencing, but training of, of certain sorts of data. And you see more of that as far as being um, adapting and learning a little bit and doing reinforcement trainings, lots of buzzwords there, I know, but, right, right. but, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of things that are going on right now. You see lots of innovation in the in academic area. You yeah. know, that's where the researchers do things, and yeah. that's where you get real data scientists, the PhDs. I would consider myself, uh, I can brag and say, maybe I'm a data analyst, okay? <laughs> Not really a practitioner, but I can. I like to, to look at some of those things. And so, yeah. But it's an interesting world. So that's generally what they're doing. The standard yeah. techniques are there. Uh, all the standard uh, benchmarks are there, and yeah. people are figuring out new ways to actually to get these uh, reduced. Uh, here's one of the big things: if you implement an algorithm on a 64-bit computer, like an Intel processor or something like that, you're doing 64-bit math, 128-bit math, you get precision way, 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 way to how many ever degrees you want. Mm. But then at the end of the day, when they've done all that through, they might be, oh, we're 95% accurate, or if we're really good, we're 98% accurate in telling right. it's just a chihuahua or just a blueberry muffin, right? Right, right. 98%, well, that's kind of a low bar. So you take that and you put it all the way down and you get down to the tiny yeah. email box where you're running on an embedded processor, maybe something from ARM yeah. or RISC-V or, or, or Cadence or whoever. And then guess what? Oh, we're not 95% accurate. Now we're like 94.5%. Yeah. And they've done an awful lot of tremendous reducing yeah. that to get down to the same thing. And if yeah. you think about that, if you're like 95% accurate, you're talking about like, you know, watching 8-bit video or something like that. Yeah. That's sort of a realm. And a lot of times that's good enough. Is that a person or is it a fire truck? Those are the keys, right? Is this whole concept of pruning, um, you know, basically stripping out the fat of a non-tiny ML algorithm or model and then reducing the number of weights, maybe just get it really, really efficient. And then going through this process of like what you're saying, compressing things where the bits per weight are dramatically reduced so that they can actually run continuously or be implemented in a constrained processing environment, sort of basic terms. And and there are lots of smarter things going on now. People are figuring out there's a term called a long short-term memory is Mm -hmm. an interesting way of handling time series with machine learning. And I don't understand all the ins of out and how that works. There's adversarial training where you play basically dueling banjos between your machine learning networks and they teach each other and figure it all out sort of thing. And so there is a lot going on. It's a lot more intelligent than the basic things. And you're going to see those things percolate up through the frameworks, whether it's something from Facebook like Glow or something from NXP who's adopting various sorts of things. You're going to see these come out. And the other thing that's happening in the chip world, you know, you've got a, you'll usually have one or two core processors and one or two DSP processors, which are very good for machine learning because they implement a very efficient multiplications. You're seeing neural network accelerators starting to show up in embedded chips. If you look at those, the guys that provide the graphics accelerators are just like NVIDIA. Oh, we've got the perfect parts. Spin our design a little bit, and now we've got an excellent neural network accelerator. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of that's going on there. Yeah. What does this mean then for the AI computing models as we know them today? I mean, I can only assume that given how we can get these really small footprint models as well as inferencing capabilities out to these endpoints, it has even a broader implication across different endpoint categories, right? I mean, why not use this for a smartphone, for instance, for some of the functions there? So, I mean, I think sort of this whole idea of a rising tide kind of lifting all boats, we have some of that going on. And you've already mentioned something about using a tiny ML to bring model training, this reinforced learning down really close to the endpoints, right? Not, I mean, not just the quote unquote network edge, but literally very close to the sensor. Well, absolutely. Especially in the the video RAM, you have seen this. We've actually seen a few handsets that picked up a standalone neural network chip Mm -hmm. and added into that. I think LG did one as opposed to just doing everything in their core baseband processor. Now it's interesting. Why would they do that? And we talked to them and, well, first of all, they had more flexibility to do more powerful things of image processing. And the big thing they were going after was uh, effectively giving you a video enhancement that would make mid to low tier devices perform as similarly to what you might expect out of a high end device. 
Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the, the baseband chip vendors aren't going to sit still. They're going to keep moving as well. Mm-hmm. But the, the bokeh effect for the black brown, background is very is blurred. Or take uh, consider some other applications, not exactly tiny, but um, I think Samsung has on some of their TVs where they might take a 4K video stream and use artificial intelligence and some sort of embedded chip in the TV right. that converts it up to your 4K or even 8K or larger video. And so that has tremendous applic- implications of bandwidth going out over the air and 5G and all that sort of thing, mm-hmm. that if it does take off that for those kinds of things, if you, like they said in Westworld, if you can't tell the difference, does it matter? Okay. <laughs> I, I guess you've seen Westworld. I'm assuming your yes. audience has watched it too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great show. I, although I was a little bit disappointed with the last season. Yeah, I think they could have. That been. was a bit disappointing, but still a great show, especially the first season. <laughs> <laughs> now we're turning into media critiques. Uh, <laughs> you're going to excite yeah. my nerd. My going to hit my nerd button here in a minute. All right. <laughs> so yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this starts to trickle its way up. But it seems to be really driven at the very edge of the endpoint universe, right? These very, very, very small devices like what we mentioned earlier with the, the headsets or the earbuds. What are you seeing as some of these early applications of tiny ML? Obviously, we're seeing some of that in personal devices. But you know, when we consider some of these really constrained environments where this kind of technology can bring either new visibility and intelligence out to, let's say, domains where we haven't been able to sense, where we haven't been able to deploy intelligence. What are some of those areas that you're seeing tiny ML present a early opportunity for value? Well, obviously, the first one is in the audio space, whether it's in yeah. uh, hearing aids or yeah. in your TWS or even in it's, it's like this. Yeah. That's the obvious one. That's the low-hanging fruit because it's so important to the human experience of, of whatever technology and, and environment you are. Secondly, after that, is think about places that require low power requirements so they mm-hmm. run on batteries. An open example is all the existing manufacturing base in the world. You mm-hmm. might want to put on some devices on there that measure vibration. You can do that with a tiny device doing DSP processing. But there can all kinds of odd things that can happen every now and then that could be indicative of trouble that normal DSP will just miss when you do your Fourier transforms and things. Right. I mean, take, for example, I guess you saw, um, maybe you've seen China syndrome, where you know they have, oh, there's a shutter in the reactor and say, oh, nothing, it's normal, it happens all the time. Well, <laughs> except for the time, it wasn't normal. So those are the things. Now, why is that important? You think, well, if I've got a factory machine, why don't I just plug it in? You might want to do four or five uh, sensors sensing various rotations and accelerations on your machine, on your multi million dollar machine, and you don't want to be running around how many Ethernet cables and how much power and how you're going to do that. And that's a great case for 5G when it comes in place in the factory space. But if you've done all that, now the question is, there's an economic cost of how often does the technician have to change the battery out? So there's that. And that's a straightforward calculation, and manufacturers will eat that up once once it's presented yeah. to them. Think about the military. I, I like to use always talk about things that hide under rocks for years, and all of a sudden they wake up and do something. Okay, classic accusation. Even for a device like a Tesla, say you want to put monitoring there, looking all these, uh, watching all the cameras around the thing. Say you're going on a trip and you've got to park for two weeks at the airport or whatever. Even though you've got a massive battery in Tesla, if you're running ordinary monitoring or the video stuff. They can discharge some batteries. And yeah. you know, my little Prius, I come back, if I leave for two or three weeks, the, the start battery might be dead, and then I'm in trouble. Yeah. So those are applications, yeah. industrial applications, security applications, yeah. and some video applications, even like uh, your ring doorbell. Oh, is this a person or is this a truck yeah. level guy? You know, and you, yeah. end your battery life. Should you wake it up? The yeah. other instance is, does it cost more energy to transfer that data over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi mm-hmm. or Zigbee? or to make the decision inside the device. And right, what you're right. most of the time is with tiny machine learning is making those decisions inside the device is a key right. thing, extending battery life. So right, because co- connectivity actually imposes a higher tax in terms of power than processing mm-hmm. itself, right? And then right, right. Um, from what I've managed to glean from research that I've done on my end is that these tiny ML algorithms tend to be very, very simple. And the function, what it does is fairly simple as well. I and mean, we're not talking about a highly complex intelligence function that you're implementing. And then um, from an IoT perspective, you're to look at what sort of scenarios might benefit because, you know, with a lot of the IoT um, use cases, you're looking at these aspirations to push 
connectivity and intelligence out to the very, very far edge and even onto device or even starting to embed these in the sensor devices. Uh, definitely agriculture, right? Livestock mm -hmm. tracking. Maybe you don't have to put a big antenna dish on the back of a, a cow and track them with a satellite. You can maybe have one of these things and use a MBIOT or a LoRaWAN connection to determine when your cow is going to have a heart attack maybe or has a digestive problem, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, I think it opens up a lot of possibilities there because that's one of the goals of these scenarios is to be able to push the intelligence out so that you don't have to send as much information back. You only provide an alert or you send information in the event of an anomaly versus providing some sort of persistent indication of state. And all those things, size, weight, and power is the primary driver of all three come together. And uh, yeah. I mean, if you could fit a chassis rack computer and hook it up to the, with a Sears diehard battery and well, I guess it's not Sears <laughs> diehard, right? hook it to your cow. And you yeah. can have one of these, one of these, you know, server level processors. Doing oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But I, I think cows have a version to having batteries attached around their neck. I, think, so. yeah, I think they I prefer think so. cowbells. <laughs> I don't know why cowbells keep coming up, but yes, oh, cowbells. You, know you need more cowbell. <laughs> That's right. You need more cowbell. <laughs> right. And uh, who knows? Eventually, maybe we'll get to this point where uh, we'll realize smart dust, the, the um, oil and gas industry i think that's one of their their dreams is to be able to have smart dust that they can send down into the well to profile mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. asset you know or the uh, um, reservoir of uh, oil you know guide their drilling operations so maybe at some point we'll get there with uh, smart ml and these really tiny little devices that are able to execute machine learning operations on a, a something the size of a piece of dust you know, because you know what we don't talk about a lot is like nano and mem MEMS technology, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of devices, like infinitesimally small devices, right? And how right. maybe something like ML will enable uh, some of that fuzzy logic now to trickle down to the uh, devices that are mm -hmm. down at a really small scale. I mean, much smaller than your earbuds. Oh, yeah. Well, th that's for sure. <laughs> I mean... We're kind of in the semiconductor industry. I think we're kind of, we've been saying it for 20 years now about the end of Moore's law, but down around five nanometers and four nanometer technology kind of feels like we're close to that. And if it's not because of the technology, it's because of the exponential increase in cost to do things that yeah. were from designing things to manufacturing things, to all that yeah. sort of stuff. So, yep, yeah, I think you're right. And I think there are yeah. small things are going to be there. The mm -hmm. net of it is with so much processing power, most of what's going on in tiny email today is like in the 28, 20 nanometer, 35 nanometer, yeah. 45 yeah. nanometer zone. If you think about that, they can't afford to do anything with five nanometers right now. But give them five years. Oh, yeah. Give yeah. Them five years and they say, well, now the NXPs and the ST micros and the microchips yeah. of the world, now they have things that are out there that would do amazing yeah. sorts of stuff that are 95% yeah. what you'd want to do. Mm -hmm. And they've got the software and the tools and everything that works together. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to be, um, I think it's going to be an uh, amazing change of physical things in the future. I think that was a great conversation. You got that off your chest, yeah. right? <laughs> right. I know you were jonesing oh, yeah. to talk about t tiny ML. And so um, if you'd like to learn more, you know, feel f uh, free to contact Joe, uh, Joe Hoffman at okay. um, SARS Insights and Consulting, right? I think I got that right. one earlier. Yeah. So apologize. Yeah. And LinkedIn. And, you can always find me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you can always contact us here at Next Curve at www.next-curve.com. You can look at me up on LinkedIn. And to our listeners and viewers, thanks for joining. Please subscribe to our YouTube and Apple podcast channels and visit us at www.next-curve.com. And until next time, be safe and stay healthy. Joe, Thanks again for sharing your expertise, your insights, and your good humor. Really appreciate it. And we're going to have you on again sometime soon on a different <laughs> exciting topic that you can't wait to talk about. <laughs> yes, you give me a chance and, you know, it's like the little uh, Everady Bunny. <laughs> yeah, there's no stopping you. <laughs> All right. Go All right. On. Cheers. Visit us at www.next-curve.com.